Hope everyone's doing well. I'm Owen Baker. Uh, greetings to you guys this morning. Wanting just to give a few announcements and then uh, we'll begin. Uh, four announcements. What do we got? Uh, Sunday school. Do we have any idea when Sunday school is actually going to start back up? Nope. Not in this month. Not in this month. Okay. So look for June. We're going to be, how is that going to be? Probably, you're going to hear it somewhere or another that Sunday school is going to be starting back up. And I'm assuming that's probably the same with youth, right? Yes. Okay. Um, graduation. How did that go? Who's out here? Was it great? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations, who do we have? We've got a number, do we have any, how many graduates do we have in the crowd right now? Anybody, one, two? I didn't graduate. You didn't graduate? No. Okay, but we've got a couple here, so let's, let's, uh, let's honor those guys. Congratulations, it was good. Congratulations for your accomplishment. Camp Timberlake, uh, four weeks summer camp in July for the fourth grade and up. Um, who's the contact person? Contact the Lynn's, okay. And prayer, obviously for the, um, what's going on in our country and in the world, just kind of keep that in your mind. So we're gonna talk about that for a second. Prayer at Jack and Judy's, uh, that's still on Wednesday at seven. And we've got Bible study at eight. Uh, I don't really know where that's at. Does anybody know where the, the boys' Bible study is at 8 o'clock Wednesday night? Uh, it's at our house. It's at your house? At the walk-ups. At the walk-ups. Okay. We have not started it again yet. Okay. So, so uh, not yet. Not yet. Okay. It's coming. Yeah. Just like everything else. <laughs> All right. Great. Okay. Um... Before we begin, I just kind of wanted to share a couple of thoughts. And it's, what's interesting about this pandemic, to me, has been what has been so striking that you have very, very different views on the pandemic. And if you, if you pay attention to anything in the news, you see remarkably contrasting views on what this is. I remember, well, I've heard the story, so there was one situation where somebody that I know went to Menards, and Menards now has it where you can't show up without a mask. And so this person went back out to their car and they got their McDonald's napkin <laughs> and stuck it in and around their sunglasses and went in and then they got in, right? So when you are in here, or when you're in one of these situations and you're out in public, it is fascinating to me to see how opposite views view each other. I look at somebody who maybe doesn't have the same perspective that I have, and I know that they have the perspective that is different than mine, and it's just kind of like going, and we're both saying the same thing to ourselves. And we know what we're saying to ourselves, right? Here's the thing that's so remarkable. Some of these people are also believers. And you kind of go, how? How in the world can you think like that? And this, to me, is an example in terms of, I think, just a metaphor for life. Where we as believers have different views on things. How, 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 how can you possibly be a Republican? How can you be a Democrat? How in the world could you ever be a Packers fan? <laughs> it's, it's amazing, and so I think the thing about it, is, and for me, one of the takeaways is what is the perspective that we need to have, or what is God telling us in terms of the perspective to take with this? Things are shifting, news is coming out, things are changing. And so I just think that there's a few things that are from Scripture that I think are important to give us kind of that context or that compass so that we can go through this, because we're navigating through this, right? The first is wisdom, James 1, 5 through 6. We all know this. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, 
and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed in the wind. This is going on right now. I mean, things are changing, and things are changing all the time. Wisdom is the thing that will guide us. The other part of it is he also instructs us as to how to honor and to respect our leaders. Hebrews 13, 17. Be helpful of others, helpful, obey your leaders and submit to them. They are keeping watch over your souls and those who will give, this is more directed towards our church leadership, but those who are given the account, let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And how do we respect, respect one another? Philippians 2, 3, do nothing based on selfish interest nor based on conceit, but with humbleness, humble-mindedness regarding one another as surpassing yourself. And lastly, live without fear. We know this one. Second Jane, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So that's my two cents for this morning. I don't know how we greet one another now. Do we stand and just look at one another? Yeah. Let's do it. Wave if you can. Good morning. It's quite really fast when you can't shake hands, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, thank you, Owen, for your words this morning, and it's good to see everybody. Um, even though we're a little bit more separate than usual um, in many ways, um, let's remember that we can come before the throne of grace this morning and every morning, not just when you're here, um, and worship the Lord. So if you join me, we're going to begin this morning by singing praise the Lord the Almighty, but first I'm going to begin with the word of prayer. God, we come before you, and we want to praise your name um, in spite of our failings, in spite of um, that we don't really even understand you just a little bit, hopefully, um, from what you've given us in your word. Um, forgive us for our insecurities. Forgive us for our um, ways when we don't treat others the way you would want us to treat them. Forgive us for not loving you the way we should and for loving this world way too much. But we come now, help us to forget all that worries us and all that is concerning us and only worship you for your greatness and your glory, for you are great and merciful and kind to us. Amen. <laughs> Let's begin by singing praise the Lord the Almighty. Amen. 
rejoice and with us sing alleluia alleluia thou burning sun with golden beam thou silver moon with softer gleam oh praise him oh praise him so strong, ye clouds that sail in heaven alone, oh praise him, hallelujah, thou rising moon in praise rejoice, ye lights of evening find your voice, oh praise him. If you'll join with me this morning in reading from Psalm 62. My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest spring, but wholly trust in Jesus. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong, and the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on him. Changing grace in every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same. Savior's love. 
can make every king bow down. Who else can whisper and darkness trembles? Only a holy God. What other beauty demands such praises? What other splendor outshines the sun? could rescue me from my failing? Who else would offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him Damien, if you want to see that, just a little bit. Yeah. All right, senior recognition. Can everybody hear us all right? Do we need to get a microphone? If you guys could speak up when I talk to you, that'd be great. All right. Okay, so um, you graduated, and we have some Bibles for you guys. Um, they are an ESV. Bible. I'll show everybody here. Should have took them out of the boxes, sorry. So got Austin's I work with him, so guess we share germs if we got them. <laughs> uh, 
So this, this is what the Bible looks like. It's an ESV study Bible. Uh, it's got maps and just all, all sorts of stuff in there for them. Um, so, I forgot my bullet. Um, I'll just hand them out to you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I've got several questions for you. One overall question for all of you that you can think about. Uh, what is one memory that you have from high school? An event, a class, um, could be a sporting event, just one memory that you're gonna kinda hold on to from high school. Um, you guys can think about that for a little bit. Um, Austin, I'll start with you. What does your summer look like and college and maybe what degree you might be looking for in college? So my summer's probably just working with you and Jess and them Midwest. Uh, I'm planning on going to Wayne for college and then probably going to something agriculture. I've been thinking about that. Probably going to go away from Spanish. Probably go into something agriculture based. Don't know what that is, but I think that's where the world's leading me to. Okay. Uh, and what, what does that summer job look like? Where is it at again? Uh, Midwest Research over by York and Bradshaw. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and yeah, what, what, what are some of your, uh, since you have been working there for a while, uh, what, what is your, your responsibilities leading up to planting and uh, what are some of your responsibilities after that? Uh, leading up to that is a lot of disking, staking, a lot of dirty work basically <laughs> for you and Jess to plant and then I help you and other people maintain that for research. So. Okay. Um. Research on what? <laughs> Crops. That we plant. Crops. <laughs> Taking plant samples, uh, stand counts, and uh, pollinating will be some big jobs. <laughs> Connor, what are your summer plans? I know you're going in the military. Um, yeah, it's pretty much all we'll be doing for the rest of the summer is I'll be in basic training in South Carolina for a while. And then after that, I will go on to my individual training and learn how to work on multi-million dollar helicopters for a lot while longer. So, yeah. And then after that, I will go to Northeast Community College in Norfolk and basically I'll be moving toward working on cars and diesel engines and stuff like that, so. Okay, so South Carolina mm -hmm. is where you're heading to this summer for basics. Yep, I'll be, I'll probably be there in about a couple weeks, so. Okay, all right, Damien. So I'm going to basic for most of the summer, but mine, Mine's in the same place, but it doesn't start for about a month after his goes in. Okay. So he'll be getting out about when I just go in. Okay. Uh, what, after basics, what do you plan to go into? Is there a branch or is there? Uh, we are both going into the National Guard and I am also working on helicopters. Okay. We have very similar plans. The only difference is I'm working on slightly different helicopters. The multi-million dollar helicopters too. Right. Yeah, he's got two propellers. Mine only got the one. Okay. Sad. Got a two propeller and a one propeller. So um, we'll start there. Okay. He's got two stars. What? He's got two stars. Two. I got the one. Okay. <laughs> Okay, and is there a memorable part of high school that you would like to share with us? Austin, I'll start with you. I think it's not like one specific memory, just probably football. Just the hours that I spent up in the weight room and then in practice and then in the games just with my brothers. Just feeling because that's just like 
I mean, that's part of high school is going to sports and playing, playing sports, basically. And then the community supports you throughout that whole entire four years. And it's just, it's a place that I definitely was very thankful for, especially after I tore my seal. I thought it really came into perspective that these are my brothers and they're going to support me and I'm going to support them. Okay. Connor, you got a... Yeah. Uh, definitely just this whole thing with the corona and it's a pretty unique experience especially to us just because like we're probably one of the first classes to ever do anything like this with kind of graduation being taken from us like that and yeah it's just kind of weird but it's definitely something I'll remember for forever so yeah. Damien you got any events? Well I was never in sports and didn't really do any out of school activities so I don't have many things like that so I guess I'm forced into saying my friends is the only thing I got. <laughs> friends will carry you. But they were the best friends I could have had. Good. That, that is great. Um, I'd like to share a Bible verse with you guys and then I'll pray for you. It comes from 1 Corinthians 1558 uh, <clears throat> and this is just a charge to you guys uh, going out moving on from your parents house um, and it's 1 Corinthians 1558 therefore my dear brothers and sisters stand firm let nothing move you always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain and that was a verse that we talked a lot about in youth group. Um, it was one of our memory verses. And uh, it helped me through my college, uh, moving out from my parents and uh, finding a good church home to be a part of was major in my college life. So uh, that's a charge to you guys. And I wrote some scriptures in your Bible that helped me through college and I, I have prayed that they will be something that you can lean on as well. So I'll just pray for you guys here and let you go. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to congratulate these graduates and to see them moving on in life. I pray that you would be with them uh, through the next step in their life, Lord, uh, as they move away from their homes and get to experience new things and opportunities to see who they are and what, what they can uh, become, Lord. I pray that they would lean on you always, and uh, if they do find themselves in, in trouble, that, uh, as you say in the Psalms, call upon me in the day of trouble, for I will deliver you and you will honor me. And I pray that in those times you would just put a ring in there, your Lord. And, and again, I thank you for these students, and I pray that you would be with them. Amen. All right, thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm real sorry for graduates this year. They've really missed out on a lot, that uh, ceremony, and those kind of things that just seem to be kind of a rite of passage uh, that uh, kind of got away from us this year, didn't it? So, well, let's uh, pray together. Um, the message today is really more targeted to graduates, but when you think about it, that's all of us. <laughs> We've, we're all graduating. Uh, we'll graduate sometime. We're kind of in graduate school right now as we uh, walk with the Lord. So, uh, But let's just pray together. Father in heaven, we do want to give you praise in a time when it just seems so confusing. And uh, we look for answers. We certainly don't find them in the newspaper or in any kind of a media sense, but uh, so we need to look up, we need to look to you, and we praise you 
that you are more than willing to give us wisdom, uh, to give us guidance, and to calm our fears, and uh, to provide and protect us. And so, Lord, we do praise you for that. We also thank you for your mercy that's new uh, for us every morning. We're thankful for your grace and for your truth, Lord. And we're thankful this morning that we can gather together in a, a number of different ways. And uh, so we want to just uh, be aware of those who are not only here uh, gathered inside, but those who are listening uh, by way of radio or through other media. Or do we want to continue to ask you to search our hearts as we know this vir uh, virus is worldwide. This is significant. This is something that you are saying to us uh, as um, a people. And uh, we ask, Lord, that you would search our hearts that we might individually ask, Lord, is there anything that I have said or done that has offended you? Uh, and that we be careful to confess that before you and, and turn from that. And uh, Lord, we just pray that uh, through uh, a nationwide time of turning to you, that we humble ourselves and do that, that you would heal not only our country, but throughout the world. And again, Lord, we are thankful that we have a place to gather. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the salvation that you give to us. And so this morning I ask, Lord, as we look into your word, that your Holy Spirit would give us a light. Help us to see the things that specifically that you have for us, Lord, that we might be encouraged this morning, that you might feed our souls, Lord, with the things that we need. And Lord, I do pray that you would continue to protect us and provide for us, um, especially be with those who have maybe lost their job or have a reduction in income or uh, those who um, might be currently confined to either some type of retirement or nursing home or hospital, that, Lord, you would uh, uh, help them uh, during that time of isolation. And we just uh, thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what if Jesus were the commencement speaker at a graduation? And you wonder what it is that he might uh, say, what advice that he might give. And I think it would probably be the same thing that we talked about a little bit last week when the lawyer came to him and asked him uh, how he would reduce the Old Testament into just a small sentence. And so I think if Jesus were the commencement speaker at a graduation, he would just say this. You need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your strength, with all of your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And as I said last week, and I think it's important for us to kind of understand that, that this is church. It really is church. You look at the Ten Commandments, the first four of those really have to do with loving God, and the other six have to do with loving one another. And so church really becomes learning who God is, how to know him better, and then how to get along with one another. And it's really about relationship. It's our relationship with God, and it's our relationship with one another. There are two uh, orientations in life. You have one that would focus on the here and the now, and then you have the worldview or the perspective that focuses in on eternity. And when you compare life that is lived in the will of God, the things that this life has to offer are often empty imitations of what is God's best. I mean, it's possible to live your life and forfeit. Jesus said, what would it profit a person if he gained the entire world but then lost his soul? It'd be like a trophy that's in a landfill. Uh, what seems to be of high value would soon lose its uh, worth uh, and soon would be worthless. And so uh, talking to graduates or just uh, us uh, all together is, what is your idea then of greatness? What does it mean to be a successful person? 
When you look at it from God's perspective, you quickly find that it's not in position, and it's not in a title, it's not in earthly gain, and it's not in achievement. He says if you want to be great, become a servant. Matthew chapter 20, verse 26, Jesus says, be different. Now, that would be a great commencement message right then. Two words, just be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among yourself must be your servant. So we see that Jesus is the perfect example of a servant by humbling himself to the point of death on a cross, something that he did not have to do. A couple of verses later, he says, I, the Son of Man, came here, what, not to be served, but to serve others and to give my life a ransom for many. So graduates, what does God want you to be? He wants you to be different. And if you choose to be a servant, you will be different. Because we live in a world that basically is all about me, about uh, getting what I can, my rights. So I'd like to have you turn this morning. I want to look at John chapter 13, and we'll read uh, some verses there. And you have some notes that I've given you uh, for this morning. And we're just going to walk our way through here this example of Jesus as a servant. So in John chapter 13, this is the night before the crucifixion. So they are gathered around a table in what's called the upper room, celebrating the feast of the Passover. It was a, a feast that they celebrated annually as a nation to remember the time when God led them out of Egypt uh, under the leadership of Moses. And so we read in John chapter 13 and verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he should depart out of this world uh, to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during the supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. Verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God, and he was going back to God, rose up from supper, laid aside his garments, taken a towel, girded himself about, then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So drop down to verse 12. It says, And so when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord in your rights, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, neither one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. And then verse 17, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Well, the first thing I gather from looking at the first three verses in there, and, and to say to all of you, is that you were born on purpose, with a purpose, and for a purpose. The interesting thing here is that look at the verse 1. Jesus knowing that his hour had come, and in verse 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things to his hand and that he had come from God and was going back to God. Jesus knew who he was from the beginning. He came from God, verse 3, and he was going back to God. Here's the question, simple question, who are you? Neil Anderson, in his book, Victory Over the Darkness, said, quote, Understanding your identity in Christ is absolutely essential to your excess, success at living the Christian life. You are created by God to change the world. And those that know who they are are secure. You can't be derailed 
turned aside from what you were determined to do. So when you know what your purpose is, that helps you to stay focused. So when Jesus knew who he was then, it freed him to fulfill his purpose. Oftentimes you would read in the Gospels where people would say to him, Jesus, you need to go over here. Jesus, you need to go over here. And he would go the opposite direction because he knew what he was. He knew his purpose, and he focused on that. He knew that he was the Son of God. We read about this in, in John chapter 5. And that his prime mission, he said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. He never got off his prime mission. So as a Christian, and I take that as a, an assumption, <laughs> I don't know the graduates personally, but my first thought to you would be, that ought to be uh, the first thing that you do is to make sure that you know that you know the Lord. That's the first thing. But as a Christian, keep, understand this. You are presently, not will be, but the moment you trust Christ, you are a child of God. You're God's kid. You're in his family. But also you are a work in progress. You are his work. He's not done with you yet. Okay? He's working on you. But also you are a citizen of heaven. We also know from Scripture that we are set apart by God and gifted for a purpose of making an eternal difference. Now, last week I said there are two things on this planet that eternal are eternal. One is the Word, and the other is people. So doesn't it make sense to focus on things that have to do with the Word and people that are going to live forever? So how do you make a difference in people's lives? <laughs> By the word, you, it is the word that makes a difference in people's lives. So Jesus knew who he was, and so he set an example that night of how to invest your life. He voluntarily came to die so that we could live forever. All through his life, he resisted temptation to get distracted so that he could take your punishment and my punishment and uh, connect us to God. Now, here's an interesting thing to think about. He did this because of the joy that was on the other side of the cross. Doesn't seem like a very joyful thing. It says, for the joy that was set before him. What was the joy that Jesus saw on the other side of the cross? He knew that by his death that mankind would finally be reconnected with God. And that gave him great joy that God and men would be reconciled. And so for that joy, he was willing to go through the cross. And now he is seated, it says, on the right hand of God. In verse 1, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come. It's his hour. Think about that. As a graduate, it's like your hour. It was your day. It is your time. But this was Jesus' time. The thing that he did on the cross, if you think about this, the whole world turned at the cross. Because before the cross, people were lost in their sin. But after the cross, God reconciled us to him and so the whole world turned on the cross this was his hour to be honored what did he do <laughs> it's interesting he focused on the needs of his disciples i mean jesus didn't have any short-termers attitude how many of you have ever put in your two-week notice <laughs> yeah, back in the back see all those hands are Ask yourself honestly, how have you actually gave an honest 40 hours of work for those two weeks, right? I mean, some of you are like, what are they going to do, fire me? I'm out of here anyway, right? You know, we have that attitude, don't we? And we do that in school. I mean, don't, uh, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or comment, but I know senioritis, right? We talk about that. What are they going to do? Not give me my diploma? You know, what are they going to do? You know, kick me out? They? I mean, we get this attitude because we think we're out of here. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't have that attitude? Hey, I'll be out of here tomorrow. What do I care? 
But what did he do? He focused on the needs of the disciples. It says in verse 1, he loved them to the end. Under the shadow of the cross, Jesus washes their feet. Now here's an interesting thing. Not only that night, the night before, did he focus on the disciples, but while he was dying for the sins of the world on the cross, he looks down and sees his mom. He's taking care of his mom while he's dying for the sins of the world. He says, Mom, behold your son. And he, he was talking about the apostle John. Because Jesus probably was the oldest in the family, and he took care of Mary. And it's believed that Joseph, his earthly father, had died. And so as the eldest, he primarily took care of her. But here he is on the cross, and he's saying, Mom, behold your son. He was basically adopting his mom into John's life. And John, he says, behold your mother. I, I find that absolutely amazing. We don't, we don't know the spiritual warfare and all that was going on to Jesus while he was dying on the cross, but he cared enough to the end to take care of his mom. And so we see him at this supper. And this is what's so awesome is the fact that Jesus was God. He who was so high, there's no other name above the name of Jesus, stooped so low. And so while he was kneeling before the disciples, what did he do? Brag about who he was? <laughs> Flash his power? Demand that they serve him? No, he gets up from supper, wraps a towel around himself, and washes their feet. See, this is a picture of what he said that he came to do. I came to seek and save that which was lost. And to the very end, he continued to do that. He did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life. So picture this again. You have God on his knees. That ought to humble you. I mean, guys that are graduating, how do you get to the top of the ladder? You fight for the lower rung. That's what Jesus was saying. If you want to be great, be a servant. And look at verse 4 then. It says, he rose from supper and laid aside his garments. In Philippians 2, 7, it says, he made himself nothing. He who was God may emptied itself, one translation says. He emptied himself, or he made himself nothing. And he took on the humble position of a slave. So Jesus did not come to act as God. He came to act as a man indwelt by God. So a person who is indwelt by God ought to have this attitude of being a servant. I like what Dr. John MacArthur writes about Jesus in regards to this particular passage. He says that Jesus owned everything. But when he came to this world, he borrowed everything. He borrowed a place to be born. He borrowed a place to sleep. He borrowed a boat to cross the Sea of Galilee and to fish in, or, um, and to preach from, I'm sorry. He borrowed a donkey to ride into Jerusalem when he was being welcomed by the people as the king of Israel. He borrowed a room for this Passover meal. He borrowed a tomb to be buried in. He was the only person who had the right to everything and wound up having nothing. He became a servant. He served everyone. He had no advantages. He had no privileges. This is God. First, in, in John chapter 1 and verse 3, he created everything there is. Nothing exists that he didn't make, and yet he became a servant. Philippians 2.8, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even to death on a cross. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? Why would he just walk away from being king of the universe and come and subject himself to that? Well, I love this verse. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says, God put the wrong on him. 
on Jesus, who never did anything wrong so that we could be put right with God. There's no greater servant attitude than that. Whenever he was tempted, and he was tempted, but it says without sin, the reason he didn't yield himself to that is so that you and I could be forgiven and have eternal life. He did that throughout his whole life. And so God put on him all of our wrong so that we could be made right with God. He always thought about us. And it says to the end. Now, it's interesting that you look at verse uh, 4. He rose from supper. He hadn't even finished his meal. <laughs> I mean, you don't see Jesus saying, I'm not done eating yet. Can you just leave me alone for a while? He rose from supper. He hadn't even finished eating. Interesting. And then it says, he laid aside his garments, and he, uh, he took a towel. Now, towels come in many, and I'm talking to the ladies right now, so the guys, you can, you can list if you want. Towels, I found this out, uh, come in many different types and sizes and colors and fabrics. You got bath towels, right? You got beach towels. You have tea towels for drying your hands. You have kitchen towels that you use for drying up spills, liquids, cleaning, and drying dishes. You got hand towels. You got face towels. Well, then you have salon towels. Now, those have numerous uses. You know, you go to a salon, you get your hair dried if it's been shampooed. They also use towels for wrapping customers who also might be there to get some kind of a massage. So hairdressers and manicurists and barbers, they all use salon towels. Well, then you have spa towels, and those have different uses. You have sports towels, and uh, those are very durable. They're made with fabrics that makes them extremely absorbent and tough. Now. I thought about this as I was doing this little study on towels. I remember I told you last week that I caddied. I worked at a golf course. One of the primary tools of a caddy is a towel. And so before I would go out with the golfers, I learned to get the ends of the towel wet because there's nothing more that makes the golfer happier than when he uses a club and hands it to the caddy that the caddy wipes the face of that club off with a wet towel because dirt on the club affects your shot. Is that true? It can. So, sports towels. Well, towel, think about a towel. It's a simple piece of cloth, right? Common, pretty non-expressive. However, <laughs> when Jesus used it to wash feet, he made that towel something very special. It was a display of humility, of self-sacrifice, and of servanthood. Taking a towel means to serve. He chose the towel first, then the throne. Not the throne first and then the towel. The towel came before the throne. And so, if you think about this, God is saying to us, to you and I, and to not only just the graduates, he wants us to be a towel. Be a towel used by Jesus to serve. Like towels, each person, each one of us is made differently by God from birth. And at birth, you were given particular talents that blossom in life. But when you come to Jesus by faith, every one of us is given at least one spiritual gift for the common good of the church. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, that gifts were given for the common good of the body, meaning a common people serving common people. If you were to read further in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you realize that God created all of us different so that we can provide value to one another. And no work is more valuable or less valuable than the other. God sees all of the work that we do and then he promises to pay us for that for eternity. Now, I want to read a couple verses to you. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 41, If someone gives you even a cup of water because you belong to Jesus, I tell you the truth, that person will surely be rewarded. And, and so it doesn't matter how small your gift is. And I don't understand the accounting system here. 
But God really, he's got us under control. He's even watching when you and I offer to someone a simple cup of water. He said, I'm writing that down. Because there's going to come a, a time that I'm going to call you out and reward you for doing that. See, the, the problem is we focus a lot on this life. We accumulate all this junk for this life. Right now I'm at the point in my life where I'm beginning to kind of downsize some stuff, looking at things and saying, I don't really need that anymore. I don't use that anymore. I've never used it for a number of years. So I'm kind of getting rid of some things. But the life that we will live to come will be much longer than the life that we have right now. And God is saying to us that what we do in this life as believers will be rewarded later on. Listen to this verse. Some of this is kind of familiar. In Matthew 6, don't store up treasures here on earth where moth eat them, where rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal them. Here's the wisdom uh, that Jesus gives. Store your treasures in heaven where they can't be destroyed and where thieves can't get to them. Where your treasure is, what? There's where your desires of your heart will be also. So when you serve, when you become a towel for Jesus, you're racking up treasure in heaven. Listen to Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Now, he's not talking about you working your way to heaven. You can't do that. Jesus took care of that for you. That's a free thing. That's a, you accept that by grace. But after you have become a believer, then the, you're serving the Lord. He promises to take care of you. At the time of salvation, it's an instant uh, thing. The Holy Spirit comes to enjoy you, but also then he gives you the ability. We call them spiritual gifts. They come in two major categories. One type would be what we call a general support ministry, which benefits the whole church. You can find those in Ephesians 4. But then there's a second type called working gifts. But to every believer, you are given a gift, which is a supernatural ability to do what you do. Now, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit again. When I was in high school, um, I was such a poor student, I was put in an alternative school. I spent the last two years of my high school uh, in a... a they were not even certain that I was even going to graduate. I mean, my sophomore year, I earned one and a quarter credit, and I think the one credit was from P.E. I think the other quarter was from lunch. I don't know. But I had no interest in school. I was a rock and roll dude, okay? I played in the band, and school had no interest in me. I was going to go and capture the world and be in a band and do all those crazy things. That's what you get when you listen to crazy friends. So I got put in this class, you know, and, and, and salvaged my high school graduation. Then the year after, I became a believer in Christ, and I ended up going to college, the first person in my family ever to go to college and graduate. And now I'm a teacher. Isn't that crazy? That's of God, because I had no interest in education. Then I came to the Lord, and he gave me an ability to do what I do. That's a supernatural gift. He's given you, all of us, a supernatural gift to do the things that he wants us to do. And so how do you know what that gift is? Well, it's the same way that you find out your natural talents. If you think that you like music, well, try some instruments. Try playing some music. I mean, you'll know whether you have ability. If, if you would like to be involved in sports or athletics, then try different things, okay? I mean, do I look like a basketball player? I mean, I have a bubble in the middle. I'm working on my ab. Singular, okay? All right? Uh, but one day, I, lived, I grew up in Canton, Ohio, okay, that's the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and as a 12-year-old, I wandered onto this field one day, this thing called the punt, pass, and kick, and I won it. I found out I was a pretty good punter, passer, and kicker. Um, and, uh, and so you athletes learn that you have ability by trying different sports. It's the same way that you discover your spiritual gifts. What attracts you? What interests you? And you try different things. And I have found that what you enjoy doing is usually what God gives you the privilege of doing. 
And so there's one important indication. I mean, people will let you know whether you stink at or not. I was in a band at school, and the, I remember my band teacher said, uh, Mike, uh, we're playing this song. I don't know what you're playing. I mean, that's a pretty good indication that I should probably give up the trumpet, right? You know? I mean, people will let you know whether you suck at something or whether you're good at it or not, right? I mean, they'll let you know. I have three tools at home. They're all hammers, depending on the size of the job, okay? My wife will not let me fix anything because it costs more to fix what I tried to fix, okay? So I am not a mechanic guy, so don't ever, if you're broke down on the side of the road, I'm sorry, I'm just driving by you because I can't help you uh, at, at that point. So that, that's just the way that I'm wired, okay? We're all wired differently. But in verse five in chapter 13, it says, then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that, in which he was girded. What I've learned is that anything we do for each other is serving. So what does being a towel look like? Well, it's important to know this. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For we, and they're talking to Christians, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ, to do good works, now here's the kicker, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So let's say Bob's working for me and, and I hire him and I have uh, three stacks of lumber and I say, Bob, uh, I need you to take these stacks of lumber and move them to the other side of the room and I'll pay you per piece. And so Bob has a choice at that point, right? He can do nothing and at the end of the, it's, it's work that I prepared for him to do in, a, in advance. He could do nothing, and at the end of the day, I come back, and he hasn't done anything. You get zero money for that, Bob. Or he could choose to do some of that. And so I come at the end of the day, and I say, oh, okay, you got half of that done. I owe you half for half. Or he could say, I'm going to get it all done, and he does it all. And I come back and I pay him according. That verse says that we were created to do work that God has in advance laid out for us to do. And at the end of the day, he will pay us accordingly for that. Now, um, so the purpose of our salvation, the purpose of coming to Christ is to serve. We, to be active in serving. And so being a Christian, then, is not a spectator sport. I mean, they used to say about football is that you have 22 guys on the field in bad need of rest and 22,000 in the stands in bad need of exercise, okay? And sometimes the church can be like that. you just got a few people doing all the work. But I'm telling you, at the end of the day, Jesus promises us is that if you didn't move anything, you're going to get nothing. But in eternity, there's a value to serving the Lord. Now, Dave Thomas, he's an Ohio guy, okay, uh, lives near Columbus, or lived near Columbus. He was a founder of Wendy's. Did you know that Dave didn't even graduate from high school? <laughs> it wasn't until after he became successful that he went and got his GED. And, and Dave, this is what he says. He says, I got my MBA long before my GED. I even have a photograph of me in my MBA graduation outfit. A snazzy, knee-length work apron. I guarantee you that I am the only founder of a major corporation whose picture in the corporate annual report shows him welding a mop and a plastic bucket. It wasn't a gag. I wasn't trying to be funny. It was a case of leading by example. See, at Wendy's, an MBA does not mean master of business administration. It means mop bucket attitude. It's how we define satisfying the customer through cleanliness, quality food, and friendly service and atmosphere. Dave had his MBA. <laughs> In this uh, book called The King Who Led With the Towel, it says, leading with the towel means serving those that I lead not so that they will serve me, but so that they will serve others. 
When you know that you belong to the Lord, you are willing then to write on your resume, I am willing to wash feet. That's what leaders do because that's what Jesus did. I guarantee you guys, gals, if you write in your resume, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do, <laughs> you, it's a pretty good chance that you're going to get a job. Well, how do you develop then this uh, servant lifestyle? First of all, in your heart, is that difficult for you? I mean, do you struggle to serve other people? So the, the thing that you need to ask yourself is, Lord, give me a servant's heart. Be open to him working and stretching and changing your heart. It may mean that you do something that you never did before. That's okay. God may bring out some things that you need to address and work on, but God can change your heart. He can soften the edges and teach you to love others with kindness and compassion. Another thing is, is add, allow God to free up your time. Ask him to show you what needs to be done and what you need to quit doing. Some of us are so busy that we don't have time to really serve the Lord, doing stuff that doesn't really matter. Third, begin placing others first in your day. What's an area that needs uh, help? What, begin to look around and see what the needs are and then... Uh, but be determined at the beginning of the day that I am going to be available to help people. And lastly, listen to God and do what he says. Follow God's prompting and leading when going about your day. If you feel like you should stop and serve, then do it. It doesn't mean that you take on all of the jobs or all of the tasks, but you pray about it and you ask the Lord, is this something that you want me to be involved in? When you go through John chapter 13, and speaking to the graduates again that have your whole life in front of you, if you invest your life in people, it will have eternal dividends. It will have eternal dividends. You can do that in a lot of different ways. Well, let's close our time in prayer. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this section of scripture as we looked at this morning that Jesus we don't even get this how this went down in the beginning of eternity how it was he who volunteered to come and to serve and to be an example that we should follow and Lord this morning I ask that you would give us individually give us as a church give us as a family or as a company give us a servant's attitude Help us to think of others more important than ourselves. Lord, I pray this morning that you would open our eyes to see what is our purpose. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? These questions that a lot of uh, young folks and other people have. And Father, I pray that you would speak to our heart about what part are we to serve in our family or in our church or in our community. The needs are great, but the workers are few. And Lord, I pray this morning that you would help us to see the eternal value of serving you and others. And Lord, most specifically today, I do ask your blessing on the graduates, not just the high school, but I know there are other people here today and that are listening that graduated from some type of program, some type of education. And I ask that you would bless them by giving them an eternal view of life. And we just thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you stand, um, we're going to end by singing Christ alone, and we're going to sing verse 1 and 4. Austin, 1 and 4. Alone, my hope is found. He is my.
my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, burned through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Thank you for coming today. It's good to see everybody. And I think, I wasn't here last week, but I think maybe the ushers dismiss us. I think what's safe for us to do is we'll just dismiss you by a back row. We encourage you to visit, but we're just...